My name is Lon Safko, co-author of the Social Media Bible, published by John Wiley and Sons, the largest book ever written on the subject of social media. And today we are here with, believe it or not, Vince Cerf, the father of the Internet. Need I say more? Wow. Uh, and we'll be speaking today about social media and its effects on the Internet. So let's get started. Vince, please tell our listeners a little bit about your background and that uh, project that you worked on a few years ago that some people might have heard about. Well, first of all, uh, labeling me the father of the Internet is uh, is not fair to an awful lot of people, especially to Bob Kahn, because Bob started the program when he was in the Defense Department uh, in 1972, and then he came to me when I was at Stanford mm-hmm. in early 73 and said, uh, you know, I have this problem. How do I hook all these different nets together? So the two of us did the basic uh, Internet design and, the, and started the uh, design of the TCP IP protocols, but there are many, many people, both before and after, uh, that stage who have contributed to make the net what it is today. Uh, so I'm just happy that uh, I could participate in it because it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of fun. That, that's to say the least. It, uh, it was probably the most important technology that changed the world, and you participated in it. So for that, I, I give you kudos. That's pretty exciting. Uh, what it, it's social media, that's what this is all about. And with your background since the conception of the Internet, what do you see the effect of social media, trusted networks, user-generated content, two-way communication? How do you see that kind of affecting and, and the, the Internet well, it, and how the interaction? It certainly uh, has been something of a surprise to me that the uh, users of the Internet, the consumers of information, have now become the producers of information mm-hmm. on the network. Uh, It's very widespread. Uh, It shows up in a number of different forms. It shows up as blogs. It shows up as video uploads to YouTube and other similar services. Uh, It shows up at uh, uh, social uh, game sites, things like World of Warcraft or or Second Life. Um, It's showing up as people with their own web pages, uh, email distribution lists and the like. Now, some of those things uh, have been around for a while. Email, of course, was invented in 1971. So... Um, it's uh, it's a, an old uh, media in some sense, um, but still very heavily used uh, as our distribution lists. There's chat, and there are other kinds of more real-time things, and including video now. So all of these different ways of interacting uh, have been very rapidly absorbed by the public. Uh, mobiles, which have only uh, recently come on the scene now account for uh, some 3 billion users uh, in the, uh, not on the Internet, but in the uh, mobile world. But the Internet interfaces to many of the mobiles, and so people are beginning to do texting uh, in the mobile world. They're doing instant messaging. They're doing uh, email exchanges. Uh, They're searching the web uh, from their mobiles. Uh, So what I'm seeing right now is a wide range of choices that people have uh, in um, maintaining relationships and in interacting uh, with people one-on-one and in groups. And I think this is likely to persist. Certainly the sharing of information in the net uh, has been dramatic. Uh, in the scientific world, uh, equally so, uh, where scientists begin to build common databases that they can make reference to, like the Human Genome Database or uh, astronomical information or uh, geophysical information, uh, we're finding that scientific results uh, occur faster uh, because people have uh, reference to virtually everything that is known about some particular phenomenon because it's been codified in these shared databases. So now we're seeing an increasing amount of collaborative work uh, in the online environment, uh, something which uh, Google, of course, is intensely interested in. Yeah, and that leads to kind of the next question. How do you feel about it? I mean, do you see that it's made a positive, social media is a positive contribution to the Internet? Well, I have mixed feelings, to be honest with you, and the reason for this is that um, some of the interactive modes strike me as being a waste of time, (laughs) but this may be a generational problem, not uh, anything more fundamental than that. Uh, Another problem, though, is that in these media, it's possible to be abusive, and uh, I am very concerned about the... Uh, the side effect of cyberbullying and things of that sort. Um, others have expressed a discomfort with the fact that uh, anything and everything can be expressed on the Internet, including uh, you know, negative uh, information, whether it's accurate or not. Uh, it sometimes has an impact. So we have 
uh, a uh, let's say a potential for both positive uh, and constructive and also rather negative kinds of interactions in this uh, online environment. And I think we're still trying to learn how to discipline ourselves and how to treat these different media uh, in a way that uh, that protects uh, protects us from some of the abusive uh, behaviors. And I'm thinking not merely uh, the social media, but you know, more generally speaking, um, things like viruses and worms and uh, things that are uh, key loggers that are looking for uh, usernames and passwords or uh, identifiers of account numbers and things of that kind. Sure. Those are all fairly pernicious uh, abuses of this online uh, medium. And I think we're still trying to learn how to cope with it socially uh, and, and legally, uh, as well as from the law enforcement point of view. One of the things in the research for the uh, Social Media Bible book I, I came across, it was kind of a revelation to me, is that uh, one way or another we've been censored in all of our media. I mean, going back all the way to the Gutenberg uh, press, uh, there, there, there's either been some government agency or the sponsor of whatever was being produced. And for the first time, uh, the Internet is not governed by the FCC. It's not governed by any government agency. Do you, do you kind of see that maybe happening at some time? Well, first of all, uh, I think you made a misstatement. Uh, the FCC believes that it is uh, responsible for all communications in the United States. And it doesn't mean that it's responsible for communications outside the United States, but it has chosen to treat Internet as a Title I information service. Now, I, there are some side effects of that which I think are not relevant to this discussion, but they're, uh, they're um, of concern to me, uh, having a lot to do with uh, common carriage and things like that. But the FCC has chosen to forbear uh, to regulate, uh, except in cases of what it considers to be um, anti-competitive practices. And you'll note that there was a recent uh, uh, decision by the FCC uh, with regard to uh, Comcast and its attempt to uh, manage uh, network use in the presence of um, BitTorrent and other kinds of peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing applications, uh, the FCC censored, uh, uh, censured uh, the uh, the Comcast uh, company for uh, the way in which it uh, undertook to do that management. Um, there are, of course, uh, other places in the world that are even more. Um, uh, actively trying to control access to and use of the Internet. You're going to find that everywhere. Uh, the Internet is global in scope. It operates in uh, virtually every country uh, in varying degrees, and uh, countries have different views of what people should or shouldn't be able to do on uh, using this medium. Uh, one of the biggest challenges, I think, is that no matter what position you take with regard to uh, usage, um, you have the problem that if your position is different from some other country's view, uh, there's nothing that you can do to enforce your view and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so then you get into this question of, gee, under my rules, uh, my uh, citizen was attacked by a person in another country, and you know, you know I'm looking for some kind of uh, compensation. Uh, you know, you will not be able to deal with those problems unless there are more common agreements about what is or isn't acceptable uh, behavior on the Internet. Uh, and since um, uh, the uh, social views uh, vary from one country to another, I think it's going to be hard for us to come to uh, global agreements. But I think we will come to some agreements commonly. Uh, an example is, uh, I think, as far as I know, every country in the world uh, rejects child pornography as an unacceptable form of behavior, uh, whether it's on the Internet or, or otherwise. So maybe there are other things that we can agree are uh, commonly unacceptable and therefore should be uh, either, you know, either prevented or punished uh, if they are detected. It's going to take a lot of international work to make that uh, a reality. That's a really good point uh, that you bring up. Again, uh, I think in the U.S. we are somewhat U.S.-centric in our views of the Internet, and that's exactly right. Every country has its own social mores, 
And for China, for example, and its ban on some of the uh, Internet access and, and Google, uh, that's absolutely true. And then you, ha you do have international fraud, uh, such as uh, the bankers uh, contacting us out of uh, North Africa, and uh, especially in uh, the Asian countries, too, as well as uh, Russia now is getting to be a problem. Um, that's all correct. And uh, it, it's, oh, by the way, I, I would like to say something about China. It's quite mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, when you talk to um, people in the street, so to speak, uh, you discover that uh, some number of them actually appreciate the censorship. Uh, oh. they, they, uh, they like it. They believe they're being protected. Now, whether, whether that's true or not is, is independent of how they feel about it or how they at least say they feel about mm -hmm. it. So we shouldn't make the assumption uh, that the First Amendment notion, which is powerful in our Constitution, uh, is necessarily universally accepted as uh, preferable. There are, are cultures where, in fact, uh, the citizens want this kind of, uh, of uh, control. That's a really good point. I, 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 now, uh, not everyone in China feels that way, and of course, I don't mean to suggest they do, but, but it's surprising to find that not everyone thinks like an American either. Yeah, that's really true. I mean, the, the, in social media, it has kind of a social perspective of power to the people, freedom from censorship. And, of course, as Will Rogers uh, once said, uh, thank God we don't get all of the government that we pay for. <laughs> <laughs> And I had a conversation, uh, an interview with uh, Kevin Marks uh, from Google Open Social, and I thought Open Social was really fascinating because it kind of touches on what we're talking about here, where they're trying to set up a standard for all communication, all information exchange between social networking sites and other types of sites. But the cool thing is, is that they're actually doing it on a global basis. And even though there's companies like LinkedIn, MySpace, Facebook, which are perceived competitors, they've all gotten together as well as Europe, South America, China, to kind of come together in a commonality to create these standards. And I thought that was pretty cool that it were, even across communist countries, that were actually, for the first time, have this commonality, pulling people together. And it's the Internet. Well, you know, it, this is, reminds me of, uh, of an interesting phenomenon that happened in the late 1980s. Um, I had asked permission from the U.S. federal government to connect MCI Mail, which is a commercial email service, up to the Internet. And uh, they reluctantly allowed me to do that. Uh, the reluctance came from the concern that we would be carrying or using uh, government-sponsored backbones to carry commercial email traffic. Yeah. But after I put the uh, MCI Mail system up on the Internet, immediately the other email service providers said, well, you know, the MCI people shouldn't have... Uh, an exclusive privilege, and so CompuServe came up, and uh, OnTime came up, and some of the other commercial email ser uh, servers uh, also came up on the net. And the side effect of this was that they could suddenly interchange email with each other through the internet, which before they couldn't do. Wow! And uh, so it's this standardization. Uh, that creates the possibility of interoperability, and this is why our uh, open social, I think, is an important uh, effort. Because if it creates interoperability among the various social networks, I think it will be very attractive for uh, the users of those networks to be able to interact regardless of which of the social network systems you happen to be uh, registered in. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we may see some interesting uh, uh, consequences of uh, of that interconnection. Um, as uh, as uh, people begin to adopt it, uh, there'll be interactions that we might not have anticipated that are enabled uh, by that standard. True. And one of the things that's exciting, at least to me, is that I do the research over the last couple of years on social media. I'm finding that really what kind of sparked social media and this interaction really was a convergence of all of the different electronics in a digital format. Uh, digital telephone communication, digital music, digital photographs, the computer, of course, is digital. And it, it seems that that's kind of what sparked it. Overall, it, what's your opinion? Do you think that all of this technology coming together is a good thing? I mean, you, do you see some positives coming out of this? Well, I'm, of course, uh, perhaps uh, understandably excited and, uh, and feel positive about a lot of these new developments. Uh, the Internet was designed to be fairly insensitive to specific media, so it doesn't know if it's carrying a digital image or a voice or a video or some other digitized object, uh, you know, part of a program or a piece of a web page. 
It just doesn't know. And that's very deliberate. It was intended to be a general purpose transport mechanism. Uh, and the consequences of that, I think, have been just as you say. Uh, every device that produces digital output uh, potentially can be interfaced to the Internet and this output transferred around and delivered to other places. Um, I think that we're going to see a very significant increase in the number of devices that are uh, able to connect to and interact with other devices on the Internet. Uh, there's been some uh, discussion about uh, the earlier phases of Internet being Internet for everyone, and uh, now it's becoming Internet for everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I really do believe that. I think sensor networks, uh, appliances, uh, things at home in the office, in the automobile that you carry around will all be Internet-enabled, and this allows uh, us to manage them better these devices can report their status to us. They can accept uh, command and control from third parties. Uh, you can imagine entertainment systems being managed over the Internet by third-party uh, entertainment managers. Uh, you simply click here if you want this movie or that song, and it takes care of the details of getting it to the, uh, you know, the CD player in the car or the, uh, the hard disk uh, that replaces the CD player or... Uh, your iPod or uh, some other, you know, uh, DVR or what have you. Um, all of these are possible once these devices become part of the Internet. And, of course, mobiles are contributing to that because as they become more and more prevalent with, uh, with Internet capability, they too will become remote controllers for many, many devices. And that's a really good point. One of the things I heard the other day is, is that some of the new cars, actually when it's time to change the oil, the car will send you a text message. Yeah, I, well, I'm not surprised. I, mean, I have a, a uh, an instrumentation system, a sensor system in my house. It's yeah. actually running IP version 6, which is the new advanced uh, Internet protocol. It re is uh, scheduled to uh, slowly replace IP version 4, which is what most people are running today. But this system uh, gathers uh, humidity and temperature uh, from sensors scattered around the house, especially the one in the wine cellar. <laughs> and uh, it reports on a daily basis uh, what its status is. Uh, the, and I can get you know little charts showing me what the variations in temperature and humidity have been over the course of a month or six months or a year. Wow. Uh, and when things break, uh, I'm, I get emails saying the following sensor is not working. And we haven't heard from it for the last two days. <laughs> Uh, you know, please change the battery or, or do something. So I expect that we're going to see more and more um, environments like that where the appliances that are around us are uh, part of the network and are capable of telling us what their condition is and accepting advice from us about what to do. Yeah, I love that. In the uh, mid-80s, um, I built the first computer to save a human life, blah, 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 and uh, worked with physically disabled and actually pioneered some of the work on environmental control and, and smart house, smart home. And this has kind of given that whole smart home thing a whole different spin. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did a, a blog on a little device that you can buy now to put into your house plants. And when the house, if the house plants gets dry, it sends you a text message. It actually tweets you to tell you that it's dry. And if you don't water it, it keeps annoying you. And if you overwater it, it complains. Hey, that's uh, where do I get some of those? My <laughs> wife is a huge. Uh fan of uh, houseplants. Oh, really? Uh, is this something that's a product? Yeah, actually, it, it, it's uh, two products that's kind of put together. It's um, a, a little electronic board that costs about $48, and then there's um, a typical uh, digital uh, moisture sensor. I'll send you the article and a, a link to the web page. I'd appreciate that. There are two companies I've dealt with in the past for sensor networks like this. One's called ArchRock, and uh, the other one's called Crossbow. Um, and I hadn't, it didn't occur to me until you just mentioned it that a, uh, wa a, you know, a dryness sensor would be a perfect, uh, I'm, I'm taking notes here. I mean, this is a really good idea. <laughs> well, just go to lonsafco.com, click on blogs, and, <laughs> and, the blo and the article is right in there. That's a little well, self-promotion. Well, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. exciting. Well, what else uh, would you like to talk about? Well, real quick, um, you mentioned the IP version 6, and some people have been talking about a total rewrite of the Internet because of the packet design and, and the speed of transmission. Do you, do you think that we're going to see that sometime soon? Well, let me see. Let's, let's distinguish IP version 6 from the what's called clean sheet efforts to Please. look at what a redesigned Internet would, uh, would look like. IPv6 was uh, standardized about 1996, and it's been a very slow process to get people to 
implemented in parallel with v4, but we are now sure that we're going to run out of IPv4 address space, unique address space, somewhere in the 2010 to 11 uh, time frame uh, at the current rate of, uh, of assignment of these Internet addresses. Uh, Google has already uh, started implementation of IPv6 together with IPv4. Uh, we, if you go to ipv6.google.com, you will actually see our IP version 6 search uh, wow. site with a logo that's animated, uh, which is one way of letting you know that you're on the v6 service instead of v4. Uh, it's going to take uh, a lot of time to uh, proliferate the IPv6 protocols everywhere. Uh, but these are not a major departure architecturally from IPv4. Um, the things you've been hearing about with regard to the redesign of the Internet are really uh, research um, programs asking the question, now that we've been around the Internet for over 30 years uh, in one form or another, what have we learned and what would we do differently mm -hmm. if we could design it all over again? And I know there are a number of things I would certainly choose to do differently, uh, mostly having to do with security and authenticity, mm -hmm. but also dealing with broadcast media in addition to point-to-point -point connections uh, and, uh, you know, several other kinds of aspects of the, of the uh, network's uh, design. So uh, along with others, I'm participating in that, um, in that exercise uh, to say what would it look like if we started over. Whether or not we get to start over is really an open question. Um, yeah. One could make the argument that there would, there's some, such a huge investment in the Internet today that uh, one couldn't imagine starting over again. And yet, uh, we could have said that same thing about the telephone network <laughs> in 1973 when Bob Cohn and I started the design of the Internet. And television has gone digital. Uh, you know, the same, same is true. So it's not impossible to imagine a, uh, something new that isn't the Internet. It's, it's something else. Uh, arising and uh, it perhaps eventually, if not supplanting it, at least uh, augmenting it, uh, which is what's happened with the telephone world today. Mm -hmm. I mean, the telephone network is still there. The Internet is there, although in increasingly people are using the Internet to carry all forms of media, including traditional telephony. Um, and it may very well be that over time the traditional telephone network simply gives way to broadband Internet access. Uh, this uh, the possibility of a complete redesign and something new that isn't the internet, but it's a successor, uh, is not out of the question in my view. But it might also take a fair amount of time to uh, have any direct impact on the world's population. And, and more than likely, be transparent to the users. Well, I don't know. That's a very <laughs> good question. I think that uh, it's certainly the internet has not been transparent nor has voice over IP been transparent to the users. I mean, you're very conscious of the difference between an ordinary telephone call and what you typically do to deal with voice over IP, although uh, I guess it's fair to say that if you take your PBX, uh, your private uh, automated branch exchange, mm -hmm. and turn it into uh, uh, a voice over IP box, the phone still looks the same. It's just that you know, your voice gets packetized and you just didn't know that. So it, yes and no. Uh, the transparency is possible, but I think it won't always be guaranteed. Okay. And, and just to conclude here, is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners about what you're working on, about social media? And, and most importantly, you're considered a futurist. You know, where do you think we're going with this? What do you, what do you think it's going to be in 10 years, 20 years? Well, it, there are two themes that are probably worth mentioning. On the social media side, uh, I'm persuaded that... Uh, people are going to increasingly use this Internet uh, base uh, and all the various social media applications on it as a way of maintaining friendships that they've established. Uh, in some cases, they will uh, uh, encounter new friends. Uh, I suspect some of the gaming environments uh, have a way to do that. And I guess there, there are social, uh, what I, I don't want to quite call them dating uh, mm -hmm. services, but there are services for people to discover each other, and put it that way, yeah. um, on, on the net. And I hear stories about people meeting and eventually uh, getting married uh, through this medium. Um, so I think we're going to see more evolution of the social networking environment. We're certainly going to see uh, increased ability to interact in richer and richer ways. Uh, today, um, we have video, we have audio, uh, we have... Oh, 3D-like environments rendered uh, for us, like uh, Second Life. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, I suspect that uh, haptic interfaces, touch interfaces, will be possible. 
uh, also three-dimensional presentations where uh, mm -hmm. two or three or some number of parties can be in, inside a 3D environment that's um, not just presented in a 2D way on a screen. Uh, sort of like the uh, uh, Star Trek holodeck, yeah. although I don't think we're anywhere close to, <laughs> to, uh, to the elaborateness of that uh, idea. Uh, but I have seen some very impressive 3D uh, display technology in the academic world um, that uh, ultimately I think will uh, become commercially available. Uh, the other thing which is happening uh, that I'm quite interested in is the extension of the Internet to operate across the solar system. Hmm. Uh, the purpose here is to support manned and robotic exploration, and new standard protocols are required to overcome some of the uh, deficiencies of trying to communicate in deep space, whether it's very, very long delays, like you know hours of round-trip times, or, uh, or disrupted uh, communications because of uh, celestial motion. So uh, I've been working with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and with NASA on the design of an interplanetary extension of the Internet, and that's wow. now uh, rapidly maturing. Uh, we'll be doing deep space testing uh, next month in October, and then we'll be on the International Space Station next year. Wow. And if all goes well, uh, these protocols will become standardized internationally and will be used in new space missions so that all the various uh, uh, explorers of space will have spacecraft that are able to enter work uh, if they choose to take advantage of that. How amazing. It's not just global now. We're actually talking intergalactic. Well, we're not intergalactic. <laughs> this is strictly interplanetary, and okay. you make sure to distinguish between the two. The distances between galaxies are really huge, <laughs> and even between stars is a problem. And I'm starting to think about an interstellar extension here, but the round-trip times are going to be years uh, yeah. at best uh, at the speed of light, so that doesn't make for a very lively conversation. <laughs> is there any place... That is absolutely fascinating. I, I know our listeners as much as probably myself. I'd like to learn more about that. Is there anything that's being published at all on the web? Does NASA have absolutely. anything? Absolutely. If you go uh, for the technical side of it, uh, if you go to www. DTN, that stands for just, uh, Delay Tolerant Networking, DTNRG Research Group, mm -hmm. .org, www.dtnrg.org. Uh, you can find out more about the technical details of the program. Uh, as we uh, get these deep space tests done, uh, we will probably uh, also report the results uh, at uh, the uh, Interplanetary Network Special Interest Group, IPN SIG. Dot org. Uh, that site needs to be updated, and it hasn't been for a while. So okay. those are two places to go to find out more. That's really exciting. Uh, I'd really like to thank you, Vin, for being here today. Thank you so very much for sharing that. Not at all. It's a pleasure to chat, and I certainly hope that our paths will cross again in the future. I'm looking forward to that again. Thank you. Uh, this has been Lon Safko, the co-author of the Social Media Bible. Be sure to check out uh, the other valuable social media tactics, tools, and strategies that can be found in the Social Media Bible book, as well as our companion website, www the Social Media Bible. For more information on me, Lon Safko, please visit my website at www.lonsafko.com. And Vint, again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for taking this time today. You're very welcome. Bye-bye for now. Take care.